Thank you, Sandrine. Thank you all for being here. Um, the paper <coughs> that I'm going to present today uh, comes from a project I've been working on on the idea of transparency in post-war French thought, and particularly the question of how <laughs> and why um, transparency, a traditional goal of philosophy and other political projects as well, came to be largely rejected as a reductive, if not totalitarian, practice across a series of disciplines after World War II. Lévi-Strauss is for me highly interesting in this regard, given his description of anthropology as a science that not only opposes a colonial gaze, a colonial gaze that would reduce the rest of the world to whatever it is that it wishes to see, but indeed anthropology is a science that is capable of redeeming at once the other and European science itself. So how could an anthropologist I don't know what's happening behind me. <laughs> um, how could an anthropologist, already often identified uh, as the foremost of his generation in the early 50s, so blithely ignore the constructive role or constitutive role of his discipline in the practices of European colonialism? And in what institutional, conceptual, and disciplinary context did it become satisfactory indeed to claim that what was to blame was uh, European homogenization, the gaze of a power that eliminates difference and that anthropology was indeed the only humanist science in a world increasingly drained of humanity. Not only the tragic and redemptive, not only the tragic bearer of redemptive, oh, blah, blah, the tragic bearer of Western guilt, but also the only one capable of redeeming the West. So I should like to argue here instead that Tristropique was less the original argument of a voice crying in the wilderness than a vivid expression of a set of concerns that were widely um, widely shared among French anthropologists. Some of the principal players in French ethnology and anthropology in the 1950s, namely Michel Leris, Alfred Metro, and André leroy Gouron, articulated in different ways that anthropology could serve as a redemptive science of extraordinary capacity and promise. It could resolve humanist and colonial problems. It could imagine a harmonious world based on difference and not on coercion. It could redeem Western knowledge from the values and from the transparentist fantasy that had contributed to the domination and homogenization of the world. As Metro would write in 1962, quote, ethnology seeks, seeks to escape from the narrow optic of our own cultural and social frames, end quote. So retaining the optical metaphor here, I want to point to three moments of this fantasy. First, the occupation. Second, participation in international institutions, especially UNESCO. And third, the anti-colonial moment of the 1950s. So beginning with the first. World War II and the occupation precipitated two significant turns in the ethnological field, namely the dispersal of French anthropologists, a dispersal that had profound institutional consequences, and the beginning of international collaboration. Some anthropologists and sociologists left the country, among them Lévis Ross, Paul Rivet, and Roger Caillois. In New York, as is well known, Levis Schoss would befriend American anthropologists such as Franz Boas, uh, Ruth Benedict, and Margaret Mead. Of course, his conversion to Roman Jacobs in structural linguistics and his subsequent use of it also date to, these, to this period. The Swiss-born anthropologist, Alfred Metro, who had been a close friend of Michel Leris and Georges Bataille in the 1920s and who had studied under Marcel Moss and Paul Rivet, had already moved to the Americas for fieldwork in the mid-1930s and then moved first to Berkeley under Robert Lowy's supervision, then to Yale, and in 1941 to the Smithsonian Institution. During the war, he and Levis Ross would uh, become close friends. Some of the major players at the Musée de l'Homme remained in France and under quite different, frequently difficult conditions. Moss and Marcel Cohen were banned from teaching and lived as Jews a, a highly precarious existence, though Moss was ostensibly protected in part by his renown. As André leroy Gouron emphasized after the war, the early issues of Résistance were published out of the Musée de l'Homme, and one of the earliest movements in the resistance began in it, with important losses among the Musée's anthropologists, including executions and deportations. Michel Leris' L'Afrique Fantôme was banned, while Leris himself reports having hidden Jewish friends and family at his home. There are, of course, major exceptions, the most notable one being Marcel Griol, whose wartime sympathies have remained the subject of considerable debate. Um, critics, including former colleagues like André Scheffner, blamed him for advancing his career, 
and perhaps excessively claimed him to be solely responsible for the banning of Lerisse's uh, La Frique Fantôme and other works. But as Jean Germain and others, um, sitting to my left, have noted, other anthropological associations, for example, physical anthropologists, were much more sympathetic to the occupation. A number of intellectual and methodological differences in the post-war period date to this uh, moment as well. Increased contact with an American anthropologist facilitated significant shifts in the referential universe and theoretical framework away from the Mossian approach of the total man, notably for Lévi-Strauss, Métro, and through them, Léris. Post-1944 involvement in international organizations produced a second shift, placing anthropologists in positions of influence that vastly exceeded their earlier reach. First, the end of the war found those anthropologists who had moved to America with a profoundly changed viewpoint on Europe and their science. Alfred Métro's path is particularly interesting. Writing just after the Libération to Michel Leris, quote, the first letter I have written to anyone in Europe in four years, Métro, despite his immense nostalgia for Europe, returned only for a short trip in 1945 to Germany with no less than the US Strategic Bombing Survey, survey to measure public opinion. After this, he joined the United Nations. But an extraordinary letter that he wrote to Leris <coughs> regarding the world he was faced with in his German trip deserves extended quotation. Quote, this voyage that I've just completed has been of the highest interest. During three months, I circulated in the south of Germany in jeeps and trucks, stopping in all sorts of picturesque locations, either to do nothing or to question people. Pointless to tell you what such a voyage during such time such times holds in terms of human documents, anecdotes, and sensations. The sight of destroyed cities is a spectacle that fascinates me. I take no pleasure in it, but this massive obliteration of urban life, of all that makes our civilization, is something so prodigious that one must observe it in person to understand its impact. Here is a vast country with a dense population which has been crushed like a nest of termites. What worries me is to know how people will pull themselves out, and so on and so forth. Are we really going to witness a total cultural regression? I have realized that I have an immoderate love for old houses and monuments. And I wanted to assure myself that not everything has been entirely destroyed. In the ravaged cities, I developed the passions of the collector for the houses or the views of streets that escaped from disaster. I cannot give you my impressions of the French zone in a letter. I returned from it very anxious and pessimistic. I came to Europe in the hope that I could be useful and could stay, but I think that it is wiser to continue an American career, more boring, more modest, less interesting, but more solid. It is possible that only the USA and England can permit the continuation of civilization, such as it is necessary for us to remain ethnographers." End quote. Germany becomes the ethnographer's object in this account. The locations are picturesque. The spectacle of destruction is fascinating. The most he does is interview people. He has developed the collector's passion, and old houses that have escaped destruction have become surviving temples of old Europe, ciphers for his hope that perhaps not all is lost, even if he is very pessimistic. He posits as his major concern the question of how to overcome this destruction, and he flees Europe only to take up a position at the UN a few months later. Europe, meanwhile, has become the ethnographer's field, Cy France, the site of friendship, America, the place from which to attempt to restore a knowledge of the world. Lévi-Strauss's use of structural linguistics as a way of thinking about kinship and myth fits quite well within this imaginary as well. Now, Métros and Lévi-Strauss's uh, systematic contact with American colleagues helped them to reintroduce American anthropology in France and to use it and their own work in order to shift the field. It is worth noting that the two of them used and reestablished the term anthropologie as opposed to the prevailing terms ethnology and sociology. Far more significantly, institutional positions, particularly Métro's job as social affairs officer at the UN as of early 1946, facilitated the participation of French anthropologists in international scientific and cultural political developments. In 1949, Métro became director of the Office of Race Relations at UNESCO, a position of importance as UNESCO began its anti-racism campaign. And from the beginning of his involvement, thanks to which he moved back to Paris, Métro began systematically including French anthropologists in the networks of scientists on which UNESCO depended in order to grant legitimacy to his work. So historians have recently focused on the early years of UNESCO, its rhetoric, 
and the transnational scientific networks. I would like to point only to one case here where Chloe Morel has noted that the original dream of a unique world culture model was abandoned already during the leadership of Julian Huxley in the late 1940s, basically to the benefit of a model of difference. And that Huxley's successor, Jamie Torres Potter, pursued this alternative with passion, military rhetoric, and religious faith. Metro shared the passion, and French involvement was, of course, of great political interest to Paris. Now, in the spring of 1950, Metro's office launched UNESCO's campaign against racism with its declaration of experts on questions of race. This declaration was drafted by a team headed by the anthropologist Ashley Montague, long known for his opposition to even the term race, and signed by, among others, Levi Strauss. Famously, Metro's department had prepared this declaration as a manifesto, only to sit back and watch as biologists and physical anthropologists criticized it harshly and forced its revision into something less than, to quote Michel Bratin, the straightforward repudiation of racial thinking that UNESCO planners had envisioned, end quote. Now, already before the first declaration was published, UNESCO had requested pamphlet-sized essays by a number of intellectuals, including Levi Strauss and Leris. Levi Strauss would go on to write Race et Histoire, a text that deliberately assaulted the understanding of indigenous peoples as primitive in the literal sense of less advanced or complex. Leris was invited to write a brochure of popularization of about 40 double-spaced typescript pages on race et civilisation. This would be due in November 1950. Levi Strauss's better known essay would of course lead also to the heated debate with Roger Caillois in 1954 and to M. Césaire's endorsement of Levi Strauss and his famous quote, I almost forgot hatred, lying, conceit. I almost forgot Monsieur Roger Caillois, end quote. I want instead to describe Leris's contribution as his composition method gives a clear sense of how the importance of American anthropology uh, affected his post-war work and because it also makes clear his advocacy of anthropological findings over and against those of the other sciences. Leris proceeded through a careful study of anthropological, sociological, and biological writings on race. He copied by hand about 100 pages of quotations strongly privileging social scientists, especially anthropologists such as Ralph Linton, Ashley Montague, Franz Boas, Metro, himself, and especially Ruth Benedict. Uh, only a couple of years earlier, he had thought very little of Benedict, leading Metro to write him a sort of get off your horse letter. Now, if the starting point for any discussion of racism for Leris was World War II, he opened by discussing National Socialism's foundation in racism, the sciences had all contributed greatly to the force and violence of the war. Quote, who could forget that the development of our sciences, if it allowed us to achieve undeniable advances, also allowed us, italics are his, to perfect to such a degree the means of destruction that have given armed conflicts in the last several decades the character of veritable cataclysms, end quote. Beginning from there, he then synthesized the quotations through a sort of montage, silently reusing or redeploying them in his own argument and then rewriting the text as his own. Leris, moreover, paraphrased and silently quoted almost the entire original declaration of experts, including all of its contentious claims. Though colleagues, though colleagues of his often referenced biologists, psychologists, and sociologists, in addition to anthropologists, Met, uh, Metro, for example, had entire folders of quotes organized by discipline, Leris opted systematically for anthropological solutions. His discipline offered the basis for a critique of the reliance on biological and other non-cultural grounds for difference. And he went so far as to copy at length Ruth Benedict's account of Mendelian genetics, as if the whole point was to avoid using a biologist's account. He did silently incorporate four passages in total from Otto Kleinberg and Gunnar Myrdal, but his only bibliographical citation was to the work of a, biologi to the work of a biologist was to that of the first president of UNESCO, Julian Huxley, and he chose We Europeans, a contentious book that he keeps his distance from and which Huxley had written with the ethnologist uh, Alfred Court Haddon in 1936. Instead of Huxley and Haddon's discussion of biological ethnic groups as unmixed and unpurifiable, Leris followed Benedict and Moss in arguing that cultural borrowings and not biology 
accounted for cultural similarity and difference. He then advocated cultural borrowing. And I think I'm going to skip on that quote. Leris remained fully aware of the consequences of his prioritization of ethnology through an emphasis on cult cross-cultural borrowing, the basic difference of cultures, and their capacity for assimilation of foreign elements. After Metro's office was obliged to amend the declaration of experts, Leris wrote to Metro to note that he might unfortunately be obliged to amend his text here and there. The published version nevertheless fully returned all the priorities Leris had drafted and shows no concessions at all to biology, physical anthropology, or the second declaration. Now, I take the composition of this text to be symptomatic of the institutional and international transformation of French anthropology, and also symptomatic of a broader newfound combativeness among anthropologists in matters of their own science. Leris' political beliefs also played a substantial role, and here, too, he expresses the post-war shift quite well. Having already written about colonialism and having expressed guilt over practices that he and his associates carried out in the Dakar Djibouti expedition as early as 1934, Leris now met M.S. Césaire in 1946. The two became close friends, and Leris became invested in the cause of the independence of the Antilles. In 1950, shortly before being invited to uh, write uh, Race et Civilisation, Leris gave a now well-known public lecture on ethnography faced with colonialism before an audience that included Césaire and Levis strauss Sartre would soon publish the lecture in Le Temps, Le Temps Moderne. Now, the lecture is significant for even though many ethnologists had followed Moss down the path of socialism, their socialism had remained almost entirely hexagonal. Here, Leris became perhaps the first French ethnologist to explicitly depict his discipline as entwined, above all, in an imperial and colonial exercise of knowledge building. He called the ethnographer, quote, all said, a collaborator, and scare quotes, the collaborator of the regime, end quote. This, um, hence, consciously referencing the occupation and offering a direct analogy of the two situations. Ethnology depended at least in part on primitivist obsessions that had to be overcome. It claimed falsely to the status of a pure science, uh, Leris contrasted to entomology there. Um, participation in the colonial regime continued now, even in the, 19, the, the turn into the 1950s, by way of claims to an education of backwards peoples, which resulted in a fundamentally colonial valorization of cultures, a process of acculturation, and, as Levi strauss would agree, homogenization. But the ethnographer for Leris was also the natural advocate of colonized societies. The education he provided could and should be used as a weapon not only against crude colonial administrators, but against colonialism as such, and against its underlying causes, he writes, capitalism. He couldn't argue for sustaining the purity of other cultures, given that acculturation was already occurring everywhere, and that petrification would be just as destructive. But he could dream a utopia in which ethnology was now the science that could teach other cultures to develop counter-ethnologies of their own, to train ethnographers who would see things differently, see Europe differently, and articulate their own culture's value accordingly. So for ethnography to contribute to true humanism, as he said, he, it had to cease being unilateral or European. Such a utopian proposal, as he called it, allowed the ethnologist to sustain the otherness of other cultures, even in a situation defined by dynamic intertwining and relations of power and violence. The interests of the colonized were thus quickly converging with the great masses within colonizing nations. These are all quotes from him. And the ethnologist could be the agent of this convergence and its resulting politics. In Larissa's work, even more than in Tristropique, while the anthropologist was explicitly shackled to colonial administration, he might also paradoxically become <coughs> a hero. Born of colonialism, he could overcome it and overcome racism in one fell swoop. So now, I will leave aside the ways in which the shift against racism and colonialism led to a spectrum of reactions to economic development practices. But allow me to conclude instead by way of recalling the shift in definitions of ethnography and anthropology during the late 1940s. As recently as 1945, in his opening lecture for a course on colonial ethnography, that's the actual title, André Leroy-Gouron had claimed that, quote, the terrain of the ethnology is unstable. 
the physician who appreciates a phenomenon is relatively certain of the nature of the phenomenon and the exactness of his calculations. The ethnologist does not enjoy such security. Take the definition of the words race, civilization, people, across a century of ethnological literature, and you will see how loose, flottant, how loose and contradictory they are. He continues, our science is still young, still in the process of leaving behind its heroic age. Now, this sense of instability was over by 1950, but the idea that ethnology had been reborn in the resistance to Nazi occupation, and that it was now profoundly committed to fighting racism and colonialism, gave direction to not only methodological innovation, but also to a politics of anthropology much more far-reaching than the socialist egalitarianism of the 1930s. Thus, the claim that anthropology was a young science became highly strategic and aimed to disperse the field of its long racial and colonial past. With Le Bistros and Leris committed to redefining exactly the words that Le Roi Gouron had called loose and contradictory, anthropologists came to view their science in almost as heroic terms as those that they had left behind. The status of ethnology in modern science, its relationship to other sciences and to French culture and empire, became the subject of a whole pile of writings, at least six of them by Le Roi Gouron, four by Leris, and eight by Le Vistros. This is, it's always these titles, uh, l'ethnologie et l'histoire, l'ethnologie et la science, l'ethnologie et le racisme. It's always sort of step by step by step, and it's more or less the same text, uh, just sort of redeployed in slightly different versions. Le Ries and Le Vistros' essay establish time and again the failure of Western humanism, and they systematically argue that if any humanism is possible, it shall come from anthropology, the one science conscious of the violence the way the West had relied on and committed to. Le Roi Gouron's definitions, though rather more academic, are no less emphatic. Ethnology, the most human of the human sciences, he says, is not a science but a scientific complex, a supersynthesis of all the human sciences. As to its history and as to the wrong direction of modern humanism, Le Roi Gouron writes, quote, the rise of ethnology is only slowed down by restrictions of social origin, which implicitly more than explicitly have weighed on its beginnings part of a Western milieu whose particular values are confounded with a general idea of human perfection in a humanism that is in reality very polarized, ethnology could not in the past take another path than that of racist argumentation, or in almost anodyne fashion to be or oriented toward curiosity and fall back down the slopes of folklore and exoticism. So in the best of cases, you get folklore and exoticism, but if you really get the real humanism, then you move to racism. Racism in anthropology is here a function of European humanism and its goal of human perfection. Moreover, today, the possibility of a new humanism could be identified with ethnology. So in offering up the figures of others that need to be understood in their totality and recognized in the way that they escape the West, the new anthropological humanism served specifically to call out blind spots of a traditional humanist gaze aimed at intercultural transparency from the Western philosophers and politicians' point of view. A new conception here of both the other and of humanity completes the thorough redefinition of a science into a different kind of ideology, of course, but a science that only recently the handmaiden of colonialism now would lay claim to being the first science, the science of dissolving man. Thank you.